In just a moment, we will be in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 4, if you'd take your Bibles to Ephesians 4. That song that we sang uh, before the prayer, where we said, Lord of harvest, send forth reapers. Um, when I was a child, my father who was one of the most evangelistic people I've ever known. Um, He wasn't a preacher formally. He didn't stand in a pulpit often. But he was always talking to people uh, that he worked with when he was digging ditches for San Diego Gas and Electric Company. And um, he, he led a lot of people to the Lord. I remember my dad would pray, almost every prayer that he prayed publicly, at the end of the prayer he would say, Lord, send forth reapers. And when I was young, I didn't really know what that meant. But as I got older, I realized that what my dad was praying was that God would stir up Christians to go out into the fields and try to harvest what God wanted to harvest. Um, Just wanted to say about that, um, I never expected to become a preacher. I don't think my dad expected me to become a preacher. Uh, And so when I finally did, I think it was partly answer to his prayer. Uh, But I want to just say about this congregation that when I was here a few years ago, you were talking a lot about um, training young men to preach. And I'm just so thankful that you all are doing that now. Uh, I'm so glad that Dylan is here working with you all. I'm thankful that you have plans to continue to do that. And I just hope you'll continue to do that. Um, there's a need for preachers to stand up here and preach to God's people, but there's also just a need for God's people to be out in the fields trying to bring in the harvest. And so thank you for leading that song. Yesterday, I began our study of the book of Ephesians by showing how a lot of the concepts in the letter that Paul wrote are actually from the Old Testament. Psalm 68, Isaiah 59 and 60 painted some images of a God who would put on armor and descend into our world, who would take people who were dead in sin, give them life, make them the children of light. And a lot of those themes through the book of Ephesians um, are really important for us to understand our identity and our purpose in this life. I'm going to do another overview of the book of Ephesians, but this one we're not going to go back to the Old Testament for. We're going to mainly just stay right here in the text. Uh, and like I said, in a moment, we're going to be in Ephesians 4. Let me, let me tell you a couple of things, though, that have been said about the book of Ephesians over the years. Uh, I read one time an old preacher said, the book of Ephesians is the Mount Everest of Scripture. I read another preacher that said, the book of Ephesians is the Grand Canyon of Scripture. And I think they were both trying to say the same thing, uh, that its, its scope is majestic, that it, it's like standing on the top of Mount Everest and seeing a beautiful sight or looking at the Grand Canyon and how deep and wide it is. And let me tell you what I think the book of Ephesians is. I believe it's Paul's revelation letter. You know how John, after he wrote the Gospel of John and the letters that he wrote, he wrote that revelation letter where the curtain was drawn back and we were told things about what was going on in the spiritual realm. In a lot of ways, the book of Ephesians is that same thing, but it's from Paul's perspective through the Holy Spirit. Um, It speaks of things that take place in the heavenly places. Chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 1, verse 20, chapter 2, verse 6, chapter 3, verse 10, chapter 6, verse 12. This phrase keeps coming up, in the heavenlies, in the heavenly places. What I believe Paul's doing in the letter is he's trying to get Christians to look at their life from God's perspective. We usually talk about our life as Christians from our perspective on earth. But Ephesians invites us into a discussion where we're looking at things from God's point of view. And so keep that in mind as we talk about some of these things together. 
Let me give you a, a way to outline the book of Ephesians. It's got six chapters, and I think there's a very natural break right in the middle. You've got three chapters of something and then three chapters of something else. Here are a couple of ways to think of this. Chapters one through three describe us in Christ. What does it mean for us to be in Christ? Chapters four through six describes Christ in us. You see the difference there? Uh, what does it mean to be in Christ? And then in the second half of the book, what, is it, what does it look like for Christ to be in us? Uh, another way to describe this would be in the first three chapters, it is the, the benefits or the privileges of being a Christian. What the spiritual blessings are in Christ. The second half of the book, with every privilege, there is a responsibility. The second half of the book is our responsibility to that privilege. Another way to say this would be the first three chapters describe the work of God, what God has done for his people. The second half of the book would be our response, our work or our walk in response to that. Some people will just make it simple like this. The first three chapters is doctrinal. The second half of the book is practical. You ever heard that before? I don't really like that distinction because all biblical teaching is doctrinal. But what they mean by that is it's more theological in the first half and more practical about how we live our everyday life in the second half. In fact, I'll challenge you on this. I bet most of the notes in your Bible are in the second half of the book. You've got things marked up in chapter 4 and 5 and 6 because that's the, what am I supposed to do as a Christian? Uh, and not as many notes maybe in the first half. That's just a guess. But let me tell you, there's a verse in Ephesians that I think helps define the whole book on, and what's on either side of it. It's the pivot verse in chapter 4, verse 1. Look at 4.1. Paul writes here, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Now, take that verse and notice how it describes what's on either side of it. It's pretty obvious from verse 1 that he's about to talk about the, the walking worthy or walking in a manner that's worthy. So chapters 4 through 6 are about the worthy walk. But what does the verse say about the first three chapters? The walk is to be worthy of the calling with which we've been called. So in my Bible, I've got an arrow uh, underlining walk in a manner worthy, pointing to the second half. And I've got um, this calling with which you've been called underlined, pointing to the first half. Because I really believe what Paul's doing in the first half of the book is trying to help us Christians know what our calling is. Now, if I was to go around the room tonight and ask this question, what is the calling of the church? What is the calling of the Christian? Do you think there'd be a lot of different ways people would phrase the answer to that? Let me tell you how I would have sort of said it when I was younger. If you would have asked me, what's the calling of the Christian? I would have said something like this. The calling of the Christian is to walk the right way. It's to live a good life. That if we are people who lied, we need to stop lying and tell the truth. Chapter 4. We need to love our spouse. Chapter 5. We need to obey our parents. You know, like if we're children, we obey our parents. Um, I, would, I would basically say that the calling was... Everything from the second half of the book. But I want you to notice the verse again. The walk is to be worthy of the calling, but the walk is not the calling. I want you to really think about that for a minute. The walk is to be worthy of the calling, but it's not the calling. And for a long time I missed this, and it really messed me up because I would then walk in a way that had really very little to do with the calling itself. So what we're going to explore in this lesson is, what do the first three chapters say 
the calling of the Christian is, that our walk is to be worthy of. So to begin this, just go back a couple of verses to chapter 3, verse 20. Look at 320. And listen to how Paul summarizes the first three chapters. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You know, verse 21, that this generational, every generation, forever and ever, God needs to be glorified in Christ Jesus and in the church. I think that's the best way to describe the calling. By the way, do you think in every generation Jesus does his job to glorify God? I believe so. But what about the church? Is God glorified in the church in every generation as he should be? I really think that's going to be the point of the first three chapters. But let's go look at it in more detail. Let's go back to chapter one, and I'm going to kind of highlight some things in each chapter to describe the calling of the Christian. Chapter one, I'll begin in verse three. Blessed be God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Let me say just a couple of things about verse 3. You notice how the word blessed happens more than once? Blessed be God who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. I think that's an important word to define. What does blessed or blessing mean? You know, there's two different words in the Greek that are translated blessed or blessing. Uh, One of the words is found in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn. That's a different word that we usually will say means something like joyful contentment or happiness, fulfillment. This word here, though, is a different word. In fact, it's strange because it says that we bless God. The Bible teaches that the greater blesses the lesser. So how could we who are lesser bless somebody who's greater? But let's look at the verse a little closer. The word here that's translated blessed, we get an English word from it. The word eulogy. Some of you this week heard a eulogy, right? Someone dies, someone stands up and speaks something about the the one that's gone. The word comes from a compound word in the Greek, eula. Have you ever known a woman named eula? They're always old. I've never met a young woman named eula, uh, but eulas are usually old women. You know what the name Eula means? It means beautiful. That's the first half of the word. The second half of the word is logos or logos. Like from John 1.1, in the beginning was the word, the logos. Beautiful words. A eulogy is to speak beautiful things, to speak well of someone or something. Now look at the verse again. We speak well of God. We eulogize God because he first eulogized us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We speak well of him because he's spoken well of us, good things into our life. By the way, that verse is a great way to define the whole book of Ephesians. The first three chapters is God blessing us. The second half of the book is us blessing God. One more thing about this verse. How many spiritual blessings are in Christ? How many? All of them. This is really important what I'm about to say. Those of you that have loved ones who are not 
in Christ. Has God blessed them in this life? The Bible answer is He has. He causes the rain to fall on the just and on the unjust. God is good to His his people, His children, the world. God blesses us abundantly. But did you realize biblically, God can bless all of humanity, but without Christ and being in Christ, there are no spiritual blessings. It's very important that you, if you're not in Christ, Figure out what it means to be in Christ, to get in Christ. Because all access to the spiritual blessings of forever are in Him. And without Him, there are none. Now, what I think Paul does next is he kind of begins to dump out a list of spiritual blessings. What do we have in Christ? And I don't think he covers everything, but he covers a lot of things. Look at some of what he says here, beginning in verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world uh, to be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of his glory, or to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to the administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. In him also we've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose, uh, his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. To the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Folks, what do you think about that list? That if we're in Christ, he's predestined us to adoption. He wants us to be holy and blameless. He's forgiven our sins. He's redeemed us. He's lavished on us wisdom and insight. He's made us a heritage, or some versions say, given us an inheritance. We're his people, his possession. We've been given the Holy Spirit of promise, sealed. You ever read this list? And it just sort of made you lift your head and you realize how blessed we really are. Let me tell you, though, that I missed something for a long time. I missed the repeated phrase in the text about why God does this for his people. You see, God doesn't just do this for me and you so that we can lift our head and feel so good about being blessed by God. Did you catch the repeated phrase? Look at verse 6. To the praise of the glory of His grace. Not to the praise of my glory. Not to the praise of the church's glory. God did what He did for us in Christ to the praise of His glory. He says it again in verse 12. At the end of verse 12. To the praise of his glory. He says it again in verse 14. That this spirit that was given as a pledge was to the praise of God's glory. So, first chapter. What is the calling of the Christian? Our walk is to be worthy of what? It has nothing to do with bringing glory to ourselves. God did what he did and does what he does so that he would be glorified to the praise of his glory. That's the way Paul begins the letter. You know, there are two prayers in this first three chapters. There's a prayer that begins around chapter 1, verse 15. And there's a prayer at the end of this section in chapter 3, verse 14. And I, I don't, I'm not going to take the time tonight to, to really dig into both prayers, but I will point out that both prayers say something very similar. That what 
Paul was praying for the church was that our eyes, actually the eyes of our heart, would be enlightened to understand this great truth, this great principle about what God's trying to do with us. Let me just show you the first prayer. Let's read verse 15. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus which exists among you all, and your love for all the saints, I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, would give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Let me stop just for a minute. You know, there's something potentially offensive about verse 17. Like if I, if I stood up in front of a group of Christians and I said, hey, Listen, Christians, here's what I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God would give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. There would be some Christians who would say, we've already got that. What do you mean you're praying for us to have wisdom and, and, um, and knowledge of him? We know him. We already know him. But what I believe Paul is praying for is a deeper level of that understanding. Same thing he's going to say in chapter 3, that we would know the height, the breadth, the length, the depth, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, a deeper kind. But he's going to be specific now about what he's actually praying for. Verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. So that you may know three things. I want you to just for a minute think about these three things. I want you to know what is the hope of his calling. Second thing, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? Third thing. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? All right, here are the three things. I want the eyes of your heart, Paul prays, to be enlightened, to know. Number one, what is the hope of his calling? You know, I, I remember the very first time I taught the book of Ephesians. I was in my early 20s. I was preaching in Los Angeles. We were studying through the book of Ephesians. I'd never taught it before. I was trying to figure out what it meant. And in the Bible class, we got to this section. And so I, I asked the class, I said, all right, these three things that are being prayed for, what do they mean? And I said, I want you to think about it for just a minute. And on the count of three, I want you all to say, what is the hope of his calling? So I said, one, two, three, and the whole church said, heaven. The hope of his calling is heaven. And I thought, well, maybe that's right. So I said, what, what about the second thing? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? What is that inheritance in the saints? One, two, three. You know what everybody said? Heaven. And I kind of scratched my head, and I was thinking, did Paul really just say, I want you to know you're going to heaven, and I want you to know you're going to heaven? I don't think so. In fact, let me offer you another way to understand what he's praying. I believe what he's actually praying is that we would understand what God's hope is in calling us, not what our hope is in being called. Look, we are already Christians because we know what our hope is, but you know what a lot of us haven't thought about is what God has hoped in calling us. There's always the hope of both the called and the caller. If I ran a great corporation, some amazing company, and I came to someone who was graduating from Western Kentucky and I said, hey, I'm going to give you a job. I'm going to call upon you to join my organization, and you're going to get this amazing job with a great paycheck, great benefits, and great prestige. They might go home and say, hey, guess what? Listen to what I get. 
I, I have this, this great new job with all these perks and all this money coming my way. That's what the called hopes for. But you know, the one who called on them also has a hope. They hope that the one that's been called will understand what the mission is, what the purpose is, why the work needs to be done. And I really believe that in the book of Ephesians, Paul is trying to shift our focus from just thinking about what our hope is to what God's hope is. Do we know why he's called us? What he's hoping for? That we would be to the praise of his glory? That the church would live out their mission? Now the reason that I believe that's what's being prayed is look at the second thing now. It does not say what are the riches of the glory of God our inheritance as the saints, it says what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. You know, between us and God, who gets the better end of the deal when it comes to inheritance? We inherit him and all that he has. But who does God inherit? Us. You know, later on in the book of Ephesians, Paul's going to talk about marriage, husbands and wives, but at the end of that he's going to say, I'll tell you a mystery. What I'm actually talking about is Christ and what? The church. Who gets the better end of the deal in that marriage? Have you ever been to a wedding where you knew somebody was getting the better end of the deal? You ever been to one of those? Like some slobbering fool gets to marry this beautiful girl and you're wondering how it happened? Or maybe it's vice versa? And you almost didn't want to go to the wedding because you're like, this doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem fair. Listen, when Paul describes in the book of Ephesians what's happening in this exchange, yes, we get God. That's wonderful. But do you know who God gets? Us. Do you want him to get us? With all of our trouble and all of our problems? You know, when I was raising my boys, there were movies that we would watch sometimes because they were kids, and there's some movies that I don't like to admit that I actually liked. Uh, but there was this movie called The Princess Diaries, and I really liked it. Um, both of them, like the first one and the second one. And the, the story of the Princess Diaries was there's this kind of slobbering American girl who doesn't have good manners. And one day, like, Mary Poppins shows up and says, hey, guess what? You're royalty. Like, you are supposed to marry a prince or a king. And the rest of the movie is how to take this girl and make her learn to act like someone that's worthy of marrying a king. Do you know that's kind of like the Bible story? Women, I mean, I'm sure that your man is your prince and your king. But if you had been betrothed to an actual king, do you think you would have thought a little bit more about some things and how you lived and how you walked and how you talked? In the book of Ephesians, Paul says, listen, I want you to think about this. I want you to think about what is the hope of his calling? What is he hoping for? What, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And then the third thing in the prayer. I'm glad he mentioned the third thing. Because I don't feel capable. I don't feel like I could ever live up to something like that. But the third thing in the prayer is, what is the surpassing greatness of his power that works in us who believe? It's kind of like we read over there in chapter 3, verse 20. God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. Did you know He can clean us up enough that when one day the bride marries the king, that it will be great rejoicing because of the work that God has done? What is that surpassing greatness of His power? Some people might say, well, it's the gospel. 
Because the gospel is the power of God to salvation. I'm not ashamed of it. That's true. That would be a good biblical answer. Some people might say that the power that works in us is the word of God. The word of God is uh, like a two-edged sword, sharp as a two-edged sword, able to pierce to the division of soul and spirit. The gospel of God, the word of God, that's the power that works in us. And I think those are good answers. But in the text, Paul doesn't leave us to guess. Look at the next couple of verses. Verse 19, what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? Which, uh, that these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, when he brought, uh, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead. You know what the power is that works in us who believe? It's resurrection power. The power that can take someone who's dead in sin and raise them to life. And not just raise them to life, but seat them with Christ in the heavenly places. He speaks of Christ in chapter 1, and in chapter 2 he's going to say the same thing about us. God can qualify us. Give us life. Raise us up. What a beautiful prayer this is. So, here's what we've got. In chapter 1, Paul says the, the purpose of our calling is to be the, to the praise of God's grace, to the praise of God's glory. And God is capable of doing this with you. Let's look at chapter 2 now. In chapter 2, the first few verses, Paul describes our deadness in sin. That there's really no hope for us except that God can bring us to life again. In fact, verse 4, when it says, but God, those are always some of the best words in the Bible. When he'll describe something about us, it'll usually be followed with, but God. God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. All right, I want to ask you a question. Why does God raise people from the dead, spiritually speaking? Why, in every generation of humanity, has he taken people that were dead in sin and raised them to life? There are two answers in the text. One of them's in verse 4. Why does God do it, according to verse 4? Because he loves us. You see that? He loves us. You know how many times I've read things like this in the Bible? And again, it's lifted my head and it's made me sort of puff out my chest and say, oh, look how much God loves me because of what he's done for me. But I think that misses the bigger point that God didn't do this just for us. Look at verse 7. Some of the most important verse, words in the book of Ephesians are the times that it says, so that... Anytime you come across a so that statement, Paul is usually saying all these things that God has done is for this purpose. Listen to the so that. So that in the ages to come, God might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Why did God need to show that? Why did God need to give a demonstration of his kindness? And by the way, when it says in the ages to come, don't think of heaven. That would be the age to come. I think what's being said in this is in every age to come, from the time that Jesus did his work, in the ages to come, the second century, the third century, the 21st century, however many more centuries there are, just like chapter 321, in every generation, you know what God wants to demonstrate and show? His kindness. All right, quick question. Does God need to give a demonstration like that nowadays? 
Don't most of your friends think that God is anything but kind? Isn't that the argument against believing in God? We look at the death and the decay and the cancer and the Holocaust and, and all of the war and all of the sickness and people shake their fist at heaven and they say, God's a monster. God's not good. Have you ever struggled with that argument? What do you say to people? You know what I've, I've, I've thought in the past is I want to say to God, God, could you just give us like a year where you take away everyone's excuses? No more sickness, no more disease, no more war, no more unkindness. God, show yourself to be kind by making the world the way everyone wants the world to be. But you know, God's never chosen to do that. But right here in chapter 2, verse 7, God tells us his counter-argument to the people that say he's not kind. Do you know what God's counter-argument is? Andy Cantrell. And you. And any of you who were once dead in sin and trespass, held by the tyrant. When he raised you to walk in newness of life, do you know what he was doing at every age? He was showing his kindness and his grace toward us. Have you ever thought about the purpose of your calling that way? That the reason you exist in the world is so that when people say God's a monster, you can speak up and say he's not. Look at what he's done. Yes, he's not changed all of the darkness in the world. He hasn't changed all of the death in the world, but he changed it in me. And he can change it in you. And he's changed it in countless people. This is God's demonstration. All right, chapter one. What's the calling? That we be to the praise of his glory. Chapter two, what's the calling? That we would show his kindness in every age. But then we get to chapter three. And chapter three might be the most mind blowing calling of the Christian that took me a long time to maybe even pay attention to. In chapter 3, Paul begins to write about this mystery. The mystery of how God was going to take the Gentiles, all of the nations, and he was going to let them be part of the commonwealth of Israel. This goes back to chapter 2. He would tear down the dividing wall between humanity. and He would make for himself one people of all nations, tribes, and tongues. He would put us together in a family. But why would God do that? What would be the purpose of him doing that? Look at the so that statement in verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 10. So that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. All right, I want you to just meditate on that verse for a minute. It's different than the first two chapters. You know, in the first two chapters, the church was still the messenger, just like 310. But the audience of chapters 1 and 2 was the world. We are to be to the praise of God's glory in front of people. We are to show the kindness of God and he demonstrates his kindness in us to the ages to come. So there's a message, we're the messenger, but people are the audience in chapters 1 and 2. Chapter 310 is different. The church is still the messenger. But who's the audience? It's not people. It's the rulers and the authorities and the powers where? In the heavenly places. God is saying something to the spiritual realm, the universe, through the church. What's he saying? Look at verse 10 again. The manifold wisdom of God. You know what manifold means? It means many folds. It's not one-dimensional. 
God's wisdom is deep and wide and profound and exquisite. And through the church, He shows that manifold wisdom to all of the spiritual beings. Anybody who's in any kind of place of authority, He shows them. And maybe there is even an argument that some of these rulers and authorities could even be earthly ones, maybe. But God's manifold wisdom is shown through the church to all of them. Again, that's mind-boggling to me. There's an implication in it. You know what the implication is? That before the church existed, before the mystery was revealed, that there was a question about God's wisdom. That's the implication. If that manifold wisdom is now being made known through the church, then the implication is they didn't really understand it before. But now they do. I want you to think about what that could look like. Back in the book of Genesis, God creates man in his image. In the image of God, he created the male and female. He created them. Do you suppose the, suppose the angels, the rulers, the principalities wondered about that? They desired to look into it. And then the Bible tells a story of the serpent, the great serpent of old, who slithers into the garden, tempts those made in the image of God to fall from the glory of God by sinning. Now, I don't know, this is speculation, but can you imagine the pompous arrogance of the devil in the spiritual realm? When he walks back in and says, do you see what I did? You think God is so smart? Look at what I've done. I've ruined his plan. Now, it amazes me that God did not take that moment in human history and in the history of the world to just destroy him then. He made allusion to it, you remember? The seed of you and the seed of woman will be at enmity, enmity, but one of these days, the seed that comes from woman, you'll bruise his heel, but he will do what? He'll crush your head. But then God lets that go for a long time until Jesus Christ comes. And in all that he conquered, in all that he did, he crushes the head of that great serpent. And God then says, look, look what I've done. Look at my people. I'm making an argument about myself through them that I am manifoldly wise. Uh, time out. I do not want God to put that spotlight on me. Do you? I don't want him showing the, the spiritual realm that I'm the answer to his manifold wisdom. Don't do that. I mean, God, let me just sort of sit out your cosmic war. Except that's not how God is. You remember one of the earliest books of the Bible, the book of Job? Who brought Job up in the conversation? Do you remember? God did. Have you considered my servant Job? No, God, don't do that. Don't, don't point at me. I don't want to be the one on display here. But in the book of Ephesians, here's what Paul's pointing out. In Christ, those of us that have been raised from death to life and put together as a family, God is not only trying to show the world that He's kind and gracious and good, He's trying to show the spiritual realm that He's manifoldly wise. That's our calling. Let me see if I can say it a different way. Uh, some of you young people up here, are you Christians already? Yes? All right. Imagine I took one of these young ladies that nodded yes, and I paraded her through Bowling Green, Kentucky, and I said, hey, everybody, look, it's, I don't know any of your names, but it's so-and-so, look at here, look at her, isn't she amazing? People might come out to see what's going on and be like, I don't know who that is. You ever feel like that in the world? 
Like, no, nobody knows who I am or what I'm doing or I'm not important here. But you guys answer this for me. If I took one of these young Christian women into the spiritual realm and paraded her in front of all of the angels and the devil himself and his angels, do you think they'd know who she was? Oh, they're aware. She is the reason, you are the reason, that the devil looks foolish. He's scheming to get you back. That's what chapter 6 will say. He's coming hard. Because the calling of the Christian is not just what we do here on planet earth. It's to live a life that means something in the spiritual realm. For many, many years, I did not think of my calling that way. I'll tell you what, folks. I'm not cut out for this. I'm not. That's why chapter 3, verse 20 is so important. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, God can make it so for us. But when we get to chapter 4, verse 1, and chapter 4, verse 1 says, look, I'm imploring you, walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. Now my walk matters. It matters to the world that I live in. It matters to the universe that God's put me on display in. Whatever he says in the second half of the book is how God's going to get his work done in our lives. So I hope, I hope you'll come back tomorrow in the next couple of nights to talk about what that walk looks like. What does it mean to walk as children of light so that the great calling of the church can be accomplished? Thanks for your attention tonight. Let me offer the invitation by just reiterating a couple of things we read. In Christ are all spiritual blessings. The blessing of forgiveness, the blessing of a future, the blessing of being an inheritance of God and having a heritage with Him, the blessing of being given the Spirit of God as a pledge. But you have to be in Christ. The Bible tells you how to do that. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and you are willing to be baptized into Christ, you'll clothe yourself with Christ. All of us are children of Abraham because we've had faith in Christ and been baptized into him. But you have to be in him. If you've forgotten as a Christian what the purpose of your calling is, please make it right tonight. From your seat, between you and the Lord, if you need our prayers, however it is that we can help you tonight, let us know while we stand and sing together.